Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to complete the topic I started last time. And uh, this first um, slide is one I gave before, just to remind you, one of the pieces of data I had was 51 use cases. And uh, last time I spent a lot of time analyzing some characteristics of each of those use cases. Uh, this time I will do um, look at some use cases in more detail and also try to um, abstract uh, some cosmic features. All right, so now I'm going to go through a couple of important uh, classes of applications. The first are those based on images, and the second those based on the Internet of Things. And I think I showed this slide last time. It shows that there are 1.8 billion images uploaded every day onto the Internet. So that shows there's a lot of images around. Um, remember, this, this corresponds to roughly um, six zettabytes of um, data that's actually available, which is the stored shared data currently available. And of course, this amount of images has come from almost nothing 10 years ago. So the whole field of um, computer vision has um, dramatically changed. Here from consumer images, but also we will see images from all sorts of scientific instruments. So if you look at those uh, 51 use cases, 10 of them are roughly image-based. Uh, we will go through several of them. The first is uh, medical imagery, uh, or looking for um, you know, cancer and things, pathology imaging. Uh, the next one we are, we, this will we'll discuss is the uh, light sources. You have these beams of intense beams of light striking either materials or, bi or biological specimens. The results of those um, of that uh, collision of the photons with the um, with the entity are recorded as images. Uh, we've we've already mentioned deep learning, and at least many of the uh, applications of deep learning are image based. Um, uh, another one I'll go through is just trying to organize all the images on the internet. Um, the example here, number 36 of the, of the uh, 51, that's a very, um, um, that's a very um, well-known example, old example, um, although uh, um, astronomers get more and more data every year because they just, uh, the devices they use to gather the information get more and more sensitive, so their images get bigger and bigger. So there are many important um, image-based astronomy applications, and there are very, some very large new um, uh, telescopes coming online over the next 10 years. Um, the items 43 and 44 are um, ones I will actually give you illustrations of. This is scientific uh, radar data, uh, either um, aircraft or other devices holding radar which records images of the Earth. And the final two examples, I don't have, a, I don't, go, I won't go through in detail. Are I mentioned, I think last time that uh, as people build these larger and larger um, supercomputers, they're getting very worried about how they look at the results from those supercomputers because the the uh, simulations, say, of a turbulent flow or um, new materials or of the of the climate and the weather. They produce very, very large um, images which need to be analyzed. So uh, let's look at this first example here, which is uh, pathology imagery. And um, I think this is still uh, got a lot of opportunity because I don't think they've developed terribly good methods of actually uh, 
analyzing images automatically to find out what's wrong with you. And um, the work being done in this area is work to um, take the images, classify them, organize them, so, and compare them. Uh, most of this work is what I call the local machine learning in the, in the previous uh, talk, that you will take these images, say MRI images or whatever they are, and you run image processing separately on each image. Um, these are such huge images, uh, you still need to work very hard there, and you will often use GPUs to be able to do this um, work in a practical time. And images are particularly good for GPUs because GPUs like nice arrays and the pixels in an image form lots of nice arrays. This slide here is from a, people, a person I collaborate with at Emory University. And he has a couple of remarks here. One is that he's actually currently using a dupe um, to, um, to, do, uh, to build a warehousing scheme for pathology images. And um, I've mentioned, I think, um, well, even I've, an important aspect of images is that they're either two or three dimensional. And therefore, the techniques for um, uh, looking at images are similar to the techniques for looking at the Earth. And so he's been building what he calls spatial analysis systems where the space is the space of pixels, and he can then look at these images in detail to find out uh, common, common pathologies and things like that. So he's using HDFS and classic Hadoop technology to do this search um, algorithm. And so I'm, I think I mentioned actually last time that search algorithms are particularly suitable for MapReduce. Um, and that's sort of uh, pretty efficient. So there's a whole area which is here called spatial analytics, which is in common with earth science and pathology, which is looking at large arrays of, um, of images, whether they be of the earth or of, or of a human uh, sample, and trying to uh, um, display them and compare them. The uh, sidebar here points out, on the left points out that um, they're generating much larger instruments in three-dimensional pathology. And with three-dimensional pathology, every image will be a terabyte. And uh, every hospital will produce petabytes of data per year. So, so this field is needs uh, to, to develop uh, two types of uh, well, it needs to continue developing the, the methodology for analyzing individual images. It needs to develop the um, search techniques to manage the images. And then somewhat harder, it needs to, and possibly the most important, it needs to classify these images so that the features that they detect can automatically and more uh, reliably determine the uh, meaning of the image. I once, I, we, we discuss clustering, but at least with some of the teams. So if you take these features and try to cluster them, there is almost no structure. There's just a continuous uh, spectrum of features, and it's not so obvious how you tell pathologies from non-pathologies. You might have thought that all pathology, if you stood, looked at some space of images, all the pathologies were over here, People with cancer were over here, and people without cancer were here, but that's not true, at least with the current techniques. They've not thought of a way of classifying images to make that automatic. So deep learning doesn't have to be image-based, uh, uh, but several of the applications are the two most obvious, so uh, pattern recognition, face recognition, and driving of cars, each of which has um, got a large collection of images. The car driving is uh, supervised learning because you have a set of images corresponding to a correctly driven car, and you're trying to classify the images from a, a new car. For face recognition, that's unsupervised learning. You um, 
these, well, it can be unsupervised learning, you want to identify ab initio uh, structure in an image, including faces. And this points out here that the data sets are measured in a, up to hundreds of terabytes. They're not actually enormous. I pointed out that the real world is six zettabytes, and uh, a petabyte is a tenth of the minus six of uh, one zettabyte, so that's not so big. And um, car is around 100 million images, each of which is around uh, a million pixels. The um, face recognition works is done on much smaller images. And um, the interesting feature of this, sort of, uh, there's a lot of work to be done designing new algorithms here. Uh, one of the, my claims is the work on good algorithms is seriously lacking in these fields. So that people have not, as the sizes of the data are <coughs> increased by these large factors, the work on new algorithms has not changed at all. People are still using the same algorithms in R and things like that that they used to use many years ago. And one of the interesting features of this problem, which is something we're trying to tackle, is that the best camp computation here was done by the Stanford group, which is mentioned in the middle, and that involves 64 GPUs and determined 11 billion parameters. The param you, you build, in this case, you have a nine-layer neural net, and you determine the weights of the connections between the neurons. And um, this particular problem is incredibly suitable for GPUs because, again, these are images which are regular, and the basic, uh, if you look at the formulae that you get out of the learning network, it consists of multiplying matrices together. And if you look at any book on um, high-performance computing from the last uh, 30 years, they will tell you that multiplying full matrices together is the most efficient, highest performance algorithm there is. Because uh, when you multiply matrices together, you take any point in one, any element in one matrix and multiply it into lots of elements in the other matrix. That gives incredibly good memory use. The main, one of the major reasons supercomputers and things are inefficient is because with sparse algorithms, a data point doesn't actually get used very often, and therefore you tend to be dominated by memory access. That is not true in these um, image-based applications because they involve full matrices. Um, so, and there is, I think I mentioned also maybe last time, there is this wonderful algorithm called stochastic gradient descent, which I, I must admit I hadn't heard of until I came to this field. And the stochastic gradient descent, you don't take your 10 million images and uh, use all those images at one time in which case you can use parallelism by summing the results of all the images together. You take a few hundred images and you just update your neural net on those few hundred images and then you go to the next few hundred images. And, so, uh, <coughs> and that gives much better answers in practice than the the, the algorithm you would have found in the books, which is sound, calculate the, um, <coughs> the, the direction of changing the neural net for doing, um, going down the steepest descent direction by summing over all images. Uh, however, if you only use a few hundred images, there is no parallelism over images. So the parallelism in this problem is over pixels, not over images. And so that's why for this, if you use this fellow, this uh, Stanford method, it, can, it actually can't go above 64 GPUs. And uh, whereas, you know, we can't use these hundreds of thousands of Azure nodes, they're not going to work. Uh, a, we need GPUs, which I'm sure Dennis will give us, but then we are stuck at 64 at the moment. And except possibly for car driving, because the car images are bigger, and we can probably go to 256 GPUs. But in general, it's a pretty interesting, in my opinion, mathematical problem to try to see if we can produce a more scalable algorithm for this very important problem. Because these same issues of stochastic gradient descent, not paralyzing 
It paralyzes, it doesn't, it paralyzes not over the data, but over the parameters. Um, that, I think, is a very important challenge, which we need a few brilliant people to work on. So these are all projects I'm working on at the moment. That last one I'm working on with um, Jack Dongara, who is a incredibly good at uh, runtime to make these things run fast, and also the Andrew Ng, who was the Stanford professor who did this work. Um, this second example is one that I, at least I think is amusing, and possibly could be very deep, because it can be extended and can actually use the 1.8 um, billion um, images. You should point out this slide, I forgot to update it. It says 500 million images, that was the number I, the number that was available until about a month ago, because uh, there is this famous um, uh, survey of the internet, which last year said 500 billion, and the version that came out about a month ago upped it to 1.8 billion. So there are 1.8 billion images every day. And the idea of this, uh, pro this um, method is shown here. All right, here we have all our images. Um, I don't know, of the Kremlin and thing, or Moscow River or what have you. And so you look at those images and you imagine a three-dimensional world. You take every image and you assign them um, a... You associate it with a camera. The camera has a position and a direction. And you do a giant least squares fit uh, to all images trying to determine the camera position or orientation for each um, image so that they reproduce the same picture of the, uh, of the uh, churches and the, and the Kremlin and things like that. So this could easily be, I mean, these are easiest to apply actually to well-known landmarks like Kremlin, Eiffel Tower, Statue of Liberty and things because those have huge numbers of images of the same, same um, uh, entity. And so the interesting thing about this is, of course, we're not using GPS. We're determining the GPS information automatically from the data. So, so this is a good example of global machine learning because it is just, the, in inverted commas, it's just a chi-squared fit. You're just producing the best consistent three-dimensional model of the world given the two-dimensional pictures you have and the uh, parameters that we've assigned to each uh, camera. And uh, we can use, it's currently it's using a dupe that's probably not very efficient for these squares fits, but iterative map produced like I twister I mentioned last time is pretty good there. Well, this one I'm not actually working on, but I know the people working on it quite well. And um, this is astronomy. Astronomy is, is um, I think, mentioned by Tony Hay. It's got a huge amount of data, maybe up to a petabyte, although uh, it's probably in practice somewhat less than that for most samples. They're about to get these very large samples. Um, and... Um, they're basically driven by Moore's law. They get more and more data every year because their sensors get better and better. And this is a, a meant to, this example here called Catalina is an example of a uh, astronomy application which is sort of um, typical of how these data gets analyzed. That's shown on the next slide. So this is again. An algorithm, you can say this is a good example of streaming algorithms. So, at least several of you are doing, we'll come to streaming algorithms in the, in the, in, um, later on, but as well as uh, tweets and um, stack overflow and things like that, where you can stream data uh, and, up, and update that data in real time or classified in real time. Here with astronomy, we have the same problem. The images are taken continuously. And actually, just like in the Twitter and the Stack Overflow data, we need to classify those images. 
So it's a pretty similar problem. This is a very important class of problem which has the batch processing stage and the streaming classification stage because you need to determine the interesting types of data uh, by some mechanism like clustering or something like that. And then you take your initial sample of data, in the case of here is astronomy images, you classify them into quasars and stars and galaxies and what have you, and supernovas. And then having done that, <coughs> every time a new image comes along, maybe it's a meteor, meteor just about to land on the Earth, uh, every time this image comes along, you apply, it to your you apply your classification algorithm and you classify each new image. So this is a very important class of problem on the internet. Take an initial sample, establish classifications, then data streams in. Here, we're, we want to classify every image because if, a, if there's a supernova we need to, or a meteor about to hit the Earth, we suddenly need to notify people about it so they can take further measurements. And this, presumably the same is true of tweets. When the tweet uh, announces some important um, um, finding, you need to get that out as quickly as possible. So the real time is needed to be able to act on the images that are taken, maybe even to control the instrument. In the case of the telescope, you want to redirect it to look at a particular part of the star. Um, but there is, you need probably some initial classification, which is going to be different in different cases. You're going to be using different algorithms. And that's not shown here. This is the, um, um, this engine here is this workflow is, you see the event classification engine, that's the streaming, that's the thing that will be done with Storm in the work that people are doing at the moment. Um, but this, I point out, this is a really important class of problem. Batch processing followed by streaming. And you also have to worry about up, I mean, this is actually a problem that Amazon and Netflix have exactly the same problem. Uh, E-commerce does because um, Netflix is a, let's say Netflix, uh, they, they've established a certain set of movies and um, maybe one day a whole new class of movie gets invented. And then their batch processing needs to get updated. This is a general problem with clustering. When you run your batch clustering algorithm, it finds these n clusters. Well, supposing a new cluster comes along. Uh, typically, you will not find new clusters from a streaming algorithm because if you streaming algorithm, you, you, the data is uh, analyzed one at a time, and you don't find one, a cluster from one example of it. That's, it's, that's probably particularly important for Twitter because probably Twitter is finding new clusters continuously. So the, uh, when you look at this model, which is batch plus streaming, a critical problem, which is where more algorithm work needs to be put in, is how you identify new, new classifiers. Because the simplest versions of these, by definition, do not find new, new classifications. They take new data stream data and classify it according to the, what's happened with the old data. As far as I know, this is a trade secret and Netflix and Amazon will not tell you how they do this. Maybe uh, Yandex and these other companies uh, will uh, know how to do it. Um, so I mentioned the uh, beam lines already and um, They are, these are dominantly what I call local machine learning because every biology or every material sample bombarded gives a separate image. Those images are pretty big. They get transported from the beam line uh, to the nearest supercomputer. At least that's what most of the ones in the, department, in the uh, United States are, are uh, run by the Department of Energy and processed by DOE supercomputers. And they run, they again will probably use GPUs very well because they're images and they're running classification of those images done separately. But this is another totally streaming data. These beam lines are just pouring photons continuously at whatever target they're looking at 
and you'll get lots and lots of images. All right, so here's an example I work on. This is a hidden Markov method, um, but there are many methods. But so the idea here is to try to understand why the uh, what's happening at the north and south poles. And so you have radar, you have aircraft fitted with radar, taking data, and the radar looks at the glacier, goes through the surface, and bounces off the bed of the glacier, uh, which is about a couple of meter, a couple of kilometers deep. And so you get a whole stream of radar images. These are again analyzed currently independently, and this is from a particular uh, um, see a particular part of the flight path. You divide the flight paths into parts. You do some complicated fast Fourier transform-based analysis, get these images like you see here, and then you have to automatically identify something which actually doesn't look too difficult here, but is actually quite hard in general, which is to find the top and the bottom. And then the top and the bottom is fed into a supercomputer simulation which tells you what happens to the glacier. And as the glaciers are melting faster than people thought they would, is of interest to know whether it's due to the fa fact that the seabed, the actual bed of the glacier is not putting, putting correctly. You can see this glacier is pretty bumpy. The, the, the uh, red, which is the bottom of the glacier, is uh, bumpy. This, uh, this is just radar at a different wavelength. This is radar looking at um, movement, earth movement. Uh, for um, analyzing the results of earthquakes. And so this comes again from radar, SAR radar overflying earthquake regions. And that radar is currently analyzed independently. Play actually, I'm, I, I'm afraid I think it's placed on Amazon. Amazon has a better relationship with the Jet Propulsion Lab where this work is done than Azure. But the, obviously this could be done on Azure. The algorithms are just these local machine learning algorithms which take every, every radar image uh, which is, um, and converts it into a, a measure of the movement on the Earth's surface. Obviously, there are lots of examples like that because you can look at radar at different wavelengths and then different, and you'll get more different types of information from the Earth. Uh, if you looked at that uh, glacier two kilometer depth uh, image, the, the, we also have data where instead of um, two kilometers, we're looking at the few centimeter difference of the snow deposited. If you look at the, um, if you look at the Arctic or Antarctic, it's a little like a tree. Every, uh, trees have rings for every year. So uh, snow has layers for every year, and you can determine those layers from radar. And of course, you can then analyze this to find why, there are, why you don't have as many layers these days as you used to. All right, so that's images. So that points out that uh, the field of big data for images is pretty exciting. And uh, now we'll <coughs> come to uh, the Internet of Things. <coughs> and... Uh, that is roughly the same as streaming. It's not quite. Um, it's not so, I mean, you, you, let's take the example of the people who are doing stack overflow, so, or, or tweets. Um, a person tweeting may or may not be thought of as a, a thing in the Internet of Things, but they act identically, because as far as the cloud is concerned, people tweeting are just individuals scattered around the around the globe sending um, transactions to the cloud which are then recorded. So that's identical to an environmental sensor detecting some, um, uh, some aspect of, of the world and, and sending that. So in, um, I have a slide which tries to show that later on. So streaming data and the Internet of Things are sort of the same problem. You have a whole set of um, 
largely independent entities recording data. So these are classic, what I call pleasingly parallel problems, because everything, whether it be a tweeter or a, a webcam, is essentially independent. You can record the data independently. You, you probably need to combine the data, but still the basic um, step is pleasingly parallel. And um, that model is also true for particle physics when people analyze the, um, to find the Higgs particle from the data at CERN. Every event is taken, uh, is taken independently. And so here we have some examples which I'll go through. Uh, and I pointed out of the 51 uh, use cases, I think either 43 of them were actually streaming in some sense. Right, so here is, uh, <coughs> here is a map. On the previous slide, I pointed out that if you go to the web, you can always get different estimates of things. Um, an industry group had some 20 billion devices on the internet by 2020. Cisco says that number is 50 billion. Here is a, a, um, a survey from this uh, well-known, um, uh, this is the same place I got the six zettabytes data from. Um, this is a good internet trend survey. This is the latest release of that showing that by tw by 2013, they were 8 billion MEMS devices, little devices measuring things. They're mainly on smartphones, I believe. And um, so you can see here, the blue are mobile phones, uh, red are headsets, there's gaming, wearables, laptops. But the dominant source of um, the Internet of Things is just people with smartphones which have many, or, or feature phones, which have many independent um, devices on them, measuring acceleration and what have you, or just webcams. Here's a variant of this um, uh, showing um, the global internet devices, slightly different uh, but related um, measure. You can see the internet of things, according to this, it's about half the devices. Um, uh, by around 2018, and there's somewhat less than half at the moment. Anyway, this number is actually, doesn't look as though it's going to go to much more than 20 billion. So this is this conservative estimate. All right, so this is a picture I drew, I've drawn many times, and it's meant to illustrate this point that uh, everything can be thought of as essentially streaming. So at the top you have somebody making decisions or somebody sitting at their laptop or smartphone examining the world, and then around the top uh, left and bottom you just have devices spewing off data and sending them somewhere. And so this points out that uh, when you look at um, streaming data, that streaming data is not just coming from your smartphone, it's coming from what I already mentioned, simulations run on supercomputers. It's coming from people looking at data in databases to um, classify tweets. All of that analysis is essentially producing streaming data. And we have Azure producing streaming data, and Amazon producing streaming data, and telescope. You can see, all, you have uh, biological sequences somewhere around here. So, as the world consists of services, services give off messages. Messages are essentially streaming. So, those any service-oriented architecture, which is the architecture we're meant to live in, is bound to have this feature of an incredible amount of streaming data, which is then candidates for analyzing with storm and things like that. And the only issue is which data you actually try to accumulate. Um, and the different communities look at different data. So the next slide is a project that 
We're doing it in Indiana, which is uh, pretty simple. Well, it's not, not so difficult. It's roughly, again, your, your Storm Kafka um, application is designed to scale to lots of um, entities, and this particularly being applied, uh, fortunately for this talk, is being applied to connects, which are sitting on so-called tutterbots, and uh, those uh, tutterbots are moving around, they're looking at the world through connects, the connect data is being sent up to Kafka and analyzed on Storm to make decisions, which are then sent back to Kafka, which sends it back to the, back to the tutterbot to tell it what to do. So this is meant to be a model of the uh, IoT cloud, where you have, um, and this is meant to be the f at least one, one aspect of the robotics future, because a robot is uh, effectively a controlled or intelligent uh, thing. And once, as you probably can't put enough computing on a robot to make it have all the capabilities you want, an important uh, aspect of um, Robotics is doing work where necessary on the cloud. And of course, the, um, the main problem with the cloud is the latency. You don't really need, you're not going to make a decision in a millisecond by sending it off to Azure or Amazon. But if you want to make a longer term decision, like a second, then you can certainly do it on the cloud. So, an important area of research here is. Um, trying to take these uh, different uh, generalized robots, and the robot is anything intelligent, the, anything uh, electronic that either has its own built-in intelligence or uses the cloud to be intelligent. And you need to be able to, um, this is a, many people have tried to work on this. Can you take the robot and divide its computing into computing on the robot and computing in the cloud? in an efficient fashion, which uh, doesn't lead to too much communication and also gets the result back on the um, robot in an efficient fashion. As far as I am, it's probable that uh, Microsoft and Google and others know the answer, think they know the answer to this, uh, but the academia doesn't. And there's ma many research papers in this area. In fact, there's a the concept which I like just from the name of the fog. So what is the fog? Well, the fog is the cloud, which is what um, maybe uh, Paul would call the private cloud. It is the, it's a, it's a haze of, of device computers near the, near the robots or near the things. So that if you want to get your answer in tens of milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, you send it to the fog, not to the cloud, because you will get fast turnaround by something that's nearby. So the academics have this rather complicated architecture, I don't know whether it's realistic, of a hierarchy of computing, where the one end is processing on the robot, the other end is processing on the cloud. And then we have these <coughs> intermediate stages. So when you, a good example is, is cars. You can imagine taking the world's roads and equipping them with computers around the, around the roads so that as your car is driving along, it doesn't have to get to uh, Azure. It can actually get to a local cluster and do its computing at that local cluster to get uh, good answers so it doesn't collide or do anything bad because cars often have to make decisions. At least they'd like to make a decision in less than a second. I don't know whether we can even read this data. It's very difficult to read, isn't it? So I can tell you what this data is. Uh, so first of all, it uses RabbitMQ, not Kafka, because we found RabbitMQ gave better performance than Kafka. Uh, that's life. Um, and um, it has a, 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 perform a, this is a plot of the so-called latency, or the turnaround time. You send a message from where you, wherever you are, to the cloud and then back again. So that's turnaround time. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're worried about. And if you look at, uh, then you can look at this in the various circumstances and you will find that all these graphs have roughly the same form. 
The latency is, I'm sorry, these clouds actually are a private cloud. They're what we call future grid, which is a private cloud uh, running OpenStack, sitting actually at Indiana University. So it's not geographically so far from, uh, from the uh, device. So when, when mainly looking at the inst instantiation time in the cloud, you, and this one is using Storm. And you can see the latencies here for local clouds is measured somewhere between naught and 10 milliseconds. And then you will find as the amount of um, communication goes up and the amount of computing that needs to be done on your cloud goes up, the latency suddenly collapses. Because at some stage, you have these data streaming through your Storm and Kafka nodes. And when that hits a limit, that it can't, when you can't process the data in time, then the data gets stacked up and the latency just goes, it becomes hopeless. So you will find that these latencies all have this roughly the same form. It sort of goes between naught and 20 or 30 milliseconds, and then it just goes essentially infinite because the system cannot catch up. When it goes infinite, you either add more nodes to your storm cluster or more nodes to your, um, to your um, uh, published subscribe cluster. And of course, we know clouds can do that, and so it's all going to work OK. But this was just with fixed numbers of nodes. But it illustrates an important feature of this problem class, that latencies are either excellent or terrible. Because when you, when you saturate the system, it, goes to, it stops working almost immediately. All right, so here are some actual examples from the 51. So the first is the UPS DHL FedEx example of uh, <coughs> tracking cargo around the world. And uh, compared to what we have now, it's feeding the data in real time. Wherever the cargo is, you're just monitoring it. <coughs> and this is done by some industry fellow who is very keen on standards, and you'll see all sorts of industry standards littered around that picture. But the basic idea is relatively clear. You already see that on, at least in the US, when you track things with UPS, <coughs> you get a signature every six, every, uh, six hours or something that says, this, uh, this packet has arrived in Indianapolis. And, it's, uh, and they basically monitor it at <coughs> discrete times. Here was another example from the Department of Energy at, in the US, which is actually, in my opinion, there's not so much work in this area. Actually, Microsoft has done probably even better work. Than, uh, actually, I think Microsoft, you're working with this lady from, uh, uh, this is Deborah Agarwal, I think you work with. And um, this is a collection of a few hundred sensors, environmental sensors around the US and a similar number um, internationally, which are again being gathered in uh, streaming data. And at the moment, I think it is mainly done with lo what I call my local machine learning. There is not much effort to, to integrate the data except to place all the data on geographical information systems. Obviously, the world is meant to have smart cities and smart roads and smart houses and smart people all covered with sensors. And then this type of application, which is coping with um, sensor data, is going to get um, particularly important. But at the moment, these numbers are not impressive. They're just a few hundreds of sensors. This one, I think, has somewhat more. And this comes from, this was work done by uh, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And they're looking at electrical grids. A modern electrical grid is full of smart instruments. And you can monitor the, uh, the status of those instruments to either decide if there's any action needed to stop power, power uh, oscillations and catastrophes, or to just help residential customers make better use of their energy. So the concept of the smart grid has been, that's a pretty old concept. As far as so we have, here's a good number. 
At the moment, Los Angeles has one and a half million sensors on their power grid. So that's not trivial, but it's, it's not enormous either. And obviously, you're going to use machine learning to classify um, um, readings and make deductions as to what to do in terms of bringing new power online or telling the user to shape up and uh, not waste so much energy and things like that. Um, this area here is one which has been forecast to get very important for many years, but so far it's not, I don't think it's as important as um, people hoped. Uh, one of Microsoft friends called Google brought a company called Nest, which makes um, devices like this from home monitoring. As far as I know, it doesn't make, it must lose money, but obviously people think this is a very important potential area. So <clears throat> the whole area of sensors with, uh, um, I, in the world or sensors on the power grid has to get more important, but so far the economics and <coughs> what have you have, have not made it uh, happen, but when it does happen, it will all be cloud-based for obvious reasons. <coughs> okay. So here's one which is actually pretty similar to what people are doing here. It is uh, analyzing Twitter data. This is a, an example where you have the batch clearly have the batch processing step as well as the streaming step because uh, you pay real money to get some fraction of the Twitter data streamed at you. Uh, they've just actually purchased a new... Unfortunately, we can discuss why they're not using Azure. They're using their own cluster, using their own money to buy the cluster, a well-known feature. That um, cluster has huge, is using HDFS and HBase and has... I don't know, maybe it has... Uh, 48 terabytes of uh, disk on every node. So it's a 10 node cluster, each with 48 terabytes of disk, so that they can store the entire um, Twitter feed, which they can get uh, over several years, and then they use that to uh, do the types of things you're doing, sentiment analysis, discovering communities, and things like that. Um, so... And the main, this work is either done using Hadoop, Twister, and a variant of HBase where to, um, as a lot of the queries are spatial queries, which is not well supported by HBase directly, there's an enhancement of HBase to support spatial queries on the Twitter data. Okay. All right, so I'm going to do one more section of this talk. All right, so I gave you those examples, 51. And then there are a bunch of other examples. I think I showed this one last time. This is a bunch of distributed um, applications. The main feature of them is that they all use data flow because they're running in the distributed fashion. And, and Programs running in one place communicate with those in another place through data flow. These are all scientific data analysis, montages, astronomy, replica exchanges, biology, climate prediction, scoop is um, ocean simulation, fusion is uh, nuclear fusion. So the people at NIST had a lot of industry types. And one in, and I'm not from some, some, some of the students probably know more about this than me. They wrote down 10 typical industry uses of data, enterprise uses. And if you look at them, they consist of different data systems, streaming, classical databases, archives, hive. There has analytics of various sort. It has workflow linking things together. And the user has been interacted with in different ways. So these are variants of a scenario involving data systems, users, and analytics. This I think I gave before. These are these uh, security and privacy. And 
you can see the classic uh, privacy places, education because it involves students, the military because it's the military, um, uh, health from pharmaceuticals through personal, personal health records, um, somewhat, le somewhat less clear how much uh, privacy is needed for things like um, uh, scanning people's use of um, devices at home. Some people may not care whether you, whether you find out what they look at. Anyway, there are a lot of challenges there, and Paul des described some of those. So, and then we had those I mentioned before. So I try to put all of this together. So I'm going to try to finish at 2.05. Is that okay? Oh, is that right? Okay, fine. Um, <clears throat> so there is a very, in, the, in this older field that Dennis and I worked on called parallel computing, there was a big effort to try to um, characterize typical parallel computing applications. And... Um, I want to try to do the same for big data. What are typical big data applications? And so if you looked at what was done in um, parallel computing, one thing that was done in so-called uh, NAS parallel benchmarks was a set of kernels, which were little nifty. They're equivalent to different analytic algorithms for the data case. These are all largely uh, different algorithms that occur when you do parallel computing. Then somewhat better known became, was work done by Berkeley, who sort of built on that and extended it with additional characteristics like MapReduce and Graph and things like that. If you look at this, there's one important deduction. Even the great people of Berkeley didn't do anything very clean. Namely, MapReduce and embody methods are not really in the same space. One is, an out, one is a characteristic of the problem slash an algorithm, and map produces sort of a programming model. And so this points out um, one important feature when you're trying to um, characterize anything. It's going to be characterized in many different dimensions. And uh, we shouldn't expect to be able to have a simple characterization and say, here's this one feature, we will classify you on that one feature. And uh, I do not see how that's likely to happen. It didn't happen in the simpler problem of parallel computing. I don't think it will happen in big data. So, so for that reason, <coughs> we propose to look at different characteristics. And this, you, you will remember these, these terms here, because these were the terms I used to classify the 51 use cases. And I told you how many they were of each type. And so I call these the problem architecture facets. These are characteristics of a big data problem that sort of tell you how it's set up. Is it a graph? Is it uh, involving global analytics or pleasingly parallel local analytics? Does it use what is famously called bulk synchronous processing? which is a classic, actually, MapReduce-style uh, approach, and MPI approach, where you do computing, communication, computing, communication. Doesn't involve workflow or agents. So this uh, set of characteristics um, characterize the way the problem is set up. So we call that a facet, one facet of the problem. There's another facet, uh, which is sort of likely to more translate into the type of algorithm or the performance, namely, how many floating point operations do you get from every byte of data? Um, what, how much communication do you need in your parallel algorithm? Is the uh, problem fixed, like the graph of the con connectivity fixed? That's quite common, or is it varying? In some cases, the graph uh, varies. Um, 
we can come back to BSP here, but I mean, the communication is sometimes asynchronous. If we do the um, Kafka problem, the communication is sort of asynchronous. Every tweet is asynchronously going to the cloud, and it has no time correlation with other tweets or other stack overflow outputs. On the other hand, um, when I'm doing my parallel clustering algorithm and collecting together the updates of the centers from different nodes, those are synchronized because you need to update the nodes from all nodes together. So there's a very important differences in communication structure. And they, they translate into different models. PubSub is designed for asynchronous. Um, MPI is designed for highly synchronous. And uh, it would be pointless to use MPI with its um, microsecond latency for synchronous communication to do things that Kafka does for PubSub because um, they're just they're solving different problems. And you also will find that corresponds to performance. Kafka runs with millisecond overheads. You'll never get PubSubs to run much better than millisecond because at the time you screw around, set up a queue, add something to a queue, then the millisecond goes by. I once had a paper called The Law of the Millisecond, which said that anything, anything like that involving macroscopic uh, uh, transactions in at least Java, because that's one of the slower languages and such things, um, always took at least a millisecond. So we've already stressed uh, the importance of iteration, some algorithms like clustering iter iterative, other algorithms like recommend engines are not. Uh, we've shown the uh, we've illustrated that data flow is actually quite important. You have different programs in different places communicating with each other. Um, another interesting data related facet is the uh, what is the data abstraction? Is it a pixel? I showed you nice image examples where pixel was the abstraction. Is it the graph? Is it a vector? And of course, Hadoop is famous for telling you the key value is all there is in life. So that data abstraction is an important area. And uh, if we come back to the uh, National Research Council report, it stresses the importance of order n squared algorithms, that there are many algorithms in data where every data point interacts with every other data point. A lot of clustering has that structure. And those are enormously compute intense. And then there's some clever mathematicians who have shown how to take order n squared and do it faster than do it uh, get miraculous speed improvements. There's a whole area of um, computational mathematics devoted to that. So these, you can see, are a set of characteristics of data problems which are, um, tell you how the data is organized, how it has to be communicated, and things like that. So it's a different facet. And the third facet is how we, how we actually, what is the nature of the data? So we have SQL and NoSQL. We have various other enterprise data aspects, which you saw in those 10 examples. If you go to most science, the data is very simple. It's always in files. When I did my 120 um, software packages, it was interesting. There was only one software package devoted to files. It was called IROTS, which dominates the science field in that area of managing files. And all the commercial, uh, corresponding commercial systems of block storage uh, managing systems, not file management systems. Anyway, we have um, many different file systems, object stores, blocks, uh, data parallel, things like HDFS, things like Lustre. Uh, the Internet of Things is essentially a style of gathering data. So we have this asynchronous streaming style. So I put streaming separately because streaming also comes from things that are not normally considered part of the Internet of Things because it comes from people. And you can, whether people are a part of the Internet of Things is not totally clear. But as far as I can see, they're roughly the same. I pointed out that another important source of data is just simulations. Um, another aspect of data is that sometimes they're managed. The data is um, spatial, whether that be spatial over images, as for pathology, or spatial over the Earth. They involve things that are effectively geographical information systems, maps. And then 
This is a <coughs> refinement of the streaming case. So if you go to um, take my friends who uh, gather data on the North and South Pole and why it's melting, they go on an expedition, which takes about a month. They go off to the North Pole. They, take, they have fly aircraft there, or they have tractors dragging things across the surface, and they spend a month at the North Pole. And they gather their data. Because there is no internet connection between the North and South Poles and the rest of the world, uh, they, the data is accumulated on magnetic on, um, disk. All, your, all the systems there have removable disks. And then they fly back every, after their month's expedition with a month's worth of data. So this points out that as well as the streaming of the Twitter style, which is measured in seconds, or, or type, of, type of latency, you also have streaming on the measured in months, blocking. Uh, the oil industry does that when they go to gather data on a new oil field. They will spend a month or so gathering seismic data and bring it back for a big supercomputer analysis. So that's a feature, a data feature. And the final thing I would I'll finish here, if we can find the next speaker, is um, so this is actually what I was most interested in. What I was most interested in when I started this was trying to classify the equivalent of the NAS parallel benchmarks, which is the different algorithms. Well, you see, if you look at the previous facets, there were things like where the data is stored, how the whole problem is set up, and how does the data re reach, the, uh, reach the cloud. And then if you look at your architecture, you're going to have this data analytics step. And I pointed out that data analytics step had various forms. One was the so-called map-only form, or pleasingly parallel form. The other was the classic map-produced form you see in search and query and recommender engines uh, with various linear classifiers and, rec and collaborative filtering. Alignment and streaming is a little like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's, uh, those are a set of analytic algorithms, which if you want to decide if your cloud is any good at data analytics, you better have strong K nearest neighbor and, st and strong um, um, biology uh, sequence alignment. And, so, and of course, strong, you're bound to have strong search engines, because that's the critical commercial capability. Then they have the things for people like me are more fun, which are these so-called global, what I call the global analytics, when we're doing these giant um, uh, inferences by taking the world's data spread across uh, hundreds of thousands, um, lots and lots of nodes, and running parallel algorithms. And um, if you look at uh, uh, five, two minutes. Then um, I pointed out already uh, the, the stochastic gradient descent is uh, an interesting algorithm there, which has a very s remarkable feature of not being parallel over what you thought, think it would be parallel of. There are, there are other, other methods of solving Newton's, Newton's equations for these large-scale optimizations, which are parallelizable in natural fashion. There's a famous method of doing nonlinear optimization called levenberg mcquart I should say, we're trying to develop all these global. We have a project just funded by the National Science Foundation in the US, which, among other things, is solving or trying to develop standard libraries with high performance in these areas. And here we have a whole bunch of, um, <coughs> of algorithms, outlier detection, clustering, mixture models, latent Dirichlet allocation, that's a topic model for uh, information retrieval, support vector machines, page rank, singular value decomposition, which is uh, an approach to topic models, um, multidimensional scaling. I mentioned that in my first talk. There's deep learning or more generally learning networks and hidden Markov methods. The um, analysis of the seabed use a hidden Markov method. And this is, I think, my, I'll stop at the last slide here. And the last, this last page here has the famous graph algorithms. 
and there's lots of work on graph algorithms, some of which I mentioned, paralyzed on distributed memory machines. Others people don't know how to do on um, distributed memory machines because the parallelism is very asynchronous and is better done with lightweight threads. And people every now and then make a discovery and show how to do this on distributed memories. I would say that's an area still, um, still being worked on. There are classic optimization algorithms like uh, quadratic and linear programming, branch and bound, which also tend to run rather poorly on distributed memory. So I, will, I think now is a good time for me to stop. What I tried to do was to give you some more detailed examples, focusing on two very important areas, the Internet of Things and streaming and images, which between them cover maybe half of those applications I listed originally. And then in the last part of the talk, I try to um, highlight the different features of the different algorithms to show how that, uh, that, A, they were very broad, and also, but if you looked at those features, you could ask, how does Azure support this? Or how does, uh, does, how does it compare with a supercomputer or uh, with Amazon or something like that on these different facets? And I gave you three facets, the problem architecture, the computational feature, and the data source. And then the fourth is not really a facet, but really the exemplars. I went through the exemplars of data analytics algorithms, finishing on this slide. So that's it.